Hi, I'm Elliot Williams, and I'm here at the Hackaday Super Conference with Sammy Kamkar, who just gave us a great talk on uh, how he reverse engineers things. What has been interesting to me as of late is um, passive entry and passive start. So these are features of, of a vehicle where you will walk up to the vehicle, and the vehicle will either A, sense you because you have a key fob in your pocket, and it might light up. And then when you pull the handle, it will then unlock. And as soon as you get in, the key fob still being in your pocket or your bag or your purse, you'll press the start engine button and the engine will turn on, right? It's kind of a magical, it's kind of a magical feature and it works really well. And I've always wondered, how does that work? And it, I got really curious when a good friend of mine, um, her car got broken into, but there was no forced entry. Uh, she had her key, she had, you know, she said that she locked the door and uh, her, her, she still got her car broken into. So I was like, all right, what, what happened? They didn't break any windows or anything like that. Um, and I believe that she locked the door. So I started looking into this. Today's topic, I mean, it ended with uh, you doing key fob hacks, but it started off with all sorts of descriptions about how you start with a new and unknown project. Yeah. Can you want yeah. to talk about that a little I mean, first? Yeah, I mean, my goal was basically sharing what is, um, and I get, people ask sort of what, what I do if I'm breaking something down, if I'm reverse engineering something, uh, or when I'm creating an attack tool, like how, how do I get to the end? Yeah. And, um, and it's a very sort of linear process, um, and it's a simple process. It's not none of it's difficult, and I think the coolest thing is none of it requires expensive tools. Um, so I really focus on how can I use low cost tools or very very few tools uh, to create really interesting new tools that can then exploit things. Um, I love exploitation and reverse engineering. I think it's, it's yeah. super fun and it's, it's kind of like being able to do a magic trick yeah. um, when you can show someone that you can do something and work with a system in a way that it wasn't meant to be used. Yeah. You said, you, in the talk, you said you started off with Google, basically. You start yeah. looking for whatever data sheets you have, mm -hmm. you open the device up, and then you work from there. Do you want to talk about that for a Yeah, second? yeah. So there's different things, right? Some, sometimes you're hacking software. If you're hacking software, you want to, you know, assuming you have access to the software, throw it in a disassembler, um, understand what the machine code is, and learn what machine code is and yeah. how assembly works. Um, if you're dealing with hardware, but, but like I said, open it up. Number one, Google, right? Because maybe yeah. someone else already did the work. Yeah. And my goal is to, I'm lazy. I want to do, use as little effort as I can yeah. to accomplish my goal. Um, sometimes it's very little effort because someone has done all the work for me and that's always amazing. Um, sometimes that's not the case and I have to do uh, some work myself. And if I can, I'll share it in the future so other people can use that. Yeah. So if it's hardware, I say Google first, but then um, open it up, you know, take out your screwdriver, even if you have no idea what you're looking at. because. I have no idea what I'm looking at most of the time, but over time, uh, opening more and more things, I start to see patterns. And then those patterns make sense because I'm like, oh, these two things are transmitters and they have this weird zigzag line. Oh, that might, that might be an antenna. Yeah. And after a while, you figure out that is an antenna. I just thought it was a weird zigzag, like a logo or something. Yeah. And you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but after enough things, you open up enough things, you start to figure that out. And then also a little bit about radio. So if you're looking at something that you can't even touch, how can you listen to it? How can you listen to the electromagnetism that's actually emanating and learn about what's going on in there? Yeah, that's really cool. I actually really love that about work on radio stuff. Um, you started, you also said you had a really neat trick, I thought, when you encountered parts that had the uh, identification shaved off them. Mm -hmm. What yeah. was that again? Yeah, so I find, I find a lot of, um, so not a lot, uh, some devices that I buy have no identification on the IC, right, on the circuit. Yeah. Um, usually there is a chip manufacturer name right on there and you can Google it and grab a data sheet. Um, I was talking a lot about chips that had no publicly available data sheets, but you yeah. can see the name. But I also ran into this one, uh, I gave an example of one chip where n there was no name, so I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Um, so I started trying to figure out what is this chip, what is it responsible for? So I used logic analyzer to uh, sniff what pins were doing. Um, I saw at one point that it sort of went to, through a little uh, analog network to an antenna. So it was right then I was like, okay, it's probably transmitting or receiving or both. So I looked at the FCC documentation for, it was a drone, yeah. um, and found the frequency was 2.4 gigahertz. So I was like, okay, let me, let me um, learn more about the pinout. And I just documented all the pins and what they were connected to. And I did conductivity tests and I used the logic analyzer. So I found all the grounds or at least things that were held low. And then I found a clock. It was obviously a clock, just a square wave, um, a pretty square wave, and uh, the voltage pins. 
And yeah. then I just mapped it out on a picture and I, I went to DigiKey. I searched for 2.4 gigahertz transceivers, transmitters, and receivers. And I downloaded every single, well, not every single data sheet. I yeah. started with a bunch. Yeah. Um, took, went down to the area that they had the pin out and then said, okay, A, is it the same pin count? If it doesn't have the same pin count, it's obviously not the same chip. Right. Then, is it the same package? If they don't offer the same package, TSOP or SOIC or whatever it is, then it's not the same chip. And then I was left with only a few with the same, similar pin out. It was like two or three left. That's fantastic. And yeah. uh, I saw one that had the ground, all the same grounds and clock. I was like, this is what they're using. And now I knew, and now I had the data sheet available to further essentially attack that drone and actually every other drone that used that chip. Yeah, that's a great technique. I really like the, you know, was, just, just uh, map out the grounds, map mm -hmm. out the power supply, map out the clocks if you yeah. can. Because you can do that quickly. It, that's I mean, dead simple. It is, it yeah. is. And it helps you narrow it down. I thought that was super clever. Oh, thanks. Um, what about equipment? What kind of tools does somebody need? basic person getting started and then what else did they want? Yeah, so this kind I, of hacking. I kinda I kinda went through my main my main list of tools on the SDR stuff. You know, I use HackRF a ton, but I also said for people who want to just get into it and dip their feet, they can get something inexpensive. HackRF itself is inexpensive for what it does, but you can spend just twenty bucks and get something on a Amazon, like an RTL SDR to get in the radio, software defined radio stuff. Yeah. Um, hardware, I mean, uh, just a screwdriver, you know, <laughs> open stuff up. Yep. Uh, you can always buy a cheap screw, screwdriver online. Yep. Um, the software, there's plenty of open source software. Um, you know, I talked about, uh, uh, there's also free software, like I use Eagle for designing PCBs. Um, they have a paid version. I use the paid version. They have a free version. There's also open source KiCad. Yep. Um, yeah, I've used both and, you know, uh, lately I've just, I like the, integrate, the integration of Eagle, so I'm using that a ton. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, it just depends what you're doing. Oscilloscope is useful, but I didn't, I didn't need an oscilloscope for many years. Um, really? So I found that everything I see says, use an oscilloscope, use an oscilloscope. But I think because maybe I was afraid of hardware for a long time, and so I stayed in the digital domain quite a bit. Um, so I went from sort of computer software and security to yeah. microcontrollers where I'm still coding. I'm still writing just C code. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of stayed away from analog, and now I'm getting into analog, and so finally I had a use for an oscilloscope doing timing attacks, and yeah. that became really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you don't. Uh, I'd say logic analyzer is pretty, pretty cool, pretty useful. Uh, I like the Salie. It's more expensive. There are yeah. more inexpensive ones, and open source software as well. And then finally, we'll get around to the the punchline here, which is that you were looking into key fob security, and there are these cars that you can walk up to and they unlock. Yeah. What does that do? And it's a really cool feature of vehicles. Um, it's called like passive start and passive entry, where you can walk up, and there's actually a communication, bi-directional communication between the key fob in your pocket and the car itself. And there's a, two different channels. One's on RFID, low frequency, can only mm -hmm. travel a few meters, and then there's a ultra high frequency, the response from the key fob. And you know, for uh, a friend of mine had the, her car broken into, and there was no forced entry, and that sort of got me interested in this area. Um, I was like, what's happening? And then I found YouTube videos online of uh, news reports of people breaking into cars and people weren't, no one knew how it was working. Yeah. And there's some awesome research that people have started doing in this area. So I just kind of wanted to learn and see if I could also make my own device that perform these attacks and learn more about these attacks and just how, how this stuff works, like how cars work and how they communicate. And ultimately, um, yeah, I was able to sort of build a device that can unlock, start the ignition of vehicles. Um, I've talked to several manufacturers, and the cool thing is they'll they'll are working on really interesting solutions to this problem too. Yeah. Um, you know, they want to fix this, and I, I think uh, many new vehicles are are coming out with some cool features to resolve this. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So the basic hack is just you use a radio in the middle to relay the signal from the key fob to the car and back, so that the whole challenge response thing can happen over distance instead of. Mm -hmm right close like it's intended to happen, yeah, right? Yeah. Is that a fair it, summary? It, yeah, very uh, very simply, you're just extending the communication. It's kind of like getting a, a Wi-Fi uh, bridge or something just to make that Wi-Fi go further. Yeah. You're just doing the same thing with RFID, but instead of keeping it at that low frequency of RFID, like 125 kilohertz, 134 kilohertz, you're up converting it into a frequency that can travel further very easily. I see. Um, and then when you travels further, you bring it back down to 125 kilohertz. So when it hits the key fob, it actually thinks that it's next to the vehicle. Right. And then when it responds, uh, you can do the same thing, transmit it back, and the vehicle then thinks the key fob is right next to it or inside of it, yeah. unlocks, 
ignition starts up and you can drive away. Yeah, that sounds really hard to defend against. Let's close it's a, up it's with a very let's close problem. up with what can the manufacturers do? Yeah, you know, the thing I say is like this is uh, security is difficult. It's very difficult, and this is a difficult problem to solve. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's some pretty cool stuff happening with time of flight. So basically, the amount of time that it takes for the communication to happen between, let's say, the car and the key fob mm. should only be a certain amount of time because RF transmits at the, near the speed of light. Right. So it should take some certain amount of time here, some certain amount of time of processing time, and then some amount of time to get back. So you can distance bound by creating a limit on that time yeah. so that if it were to replay here, it has to go much further and then back. Plus, there's more processing time of your attack tools. Yeah. Um, now that's still probably a hard, a hard problem. And, you know, as an, uh, I'm on the offensive side and I have to say it's easier to attack than it is to defend. Um, so you know, I respect the people who like create sure. actual solutions to, to these problems. And I'm always interested in how they do that and honestly, how to attack that too. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Yeah, that's a great talk. Thanks oh, very much awesome. for being with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.